Okay, why don't we call the meeting to order at 4.01 p.m. And we'll go to item two, which is approval of minutes. Uh, does anybody have any amendments or revisions for the minute, minutes from the December 14th meeting? Perhaps. Okay. What is the perhaps? I think I heard perhaps, right? Do we have revisions? Robert Dilde, I move we approve the minutes for December 14th. Thank you, Mr. Dilde. Uh, can I get a second on the motion? Tom Dill, second. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any uh, dissenters say nay? All right, approved. Thank you. Um, now we're in item three, public participation. Public participation enables the public to address the commission about an item that is not on the agenda. If you wish to address the commission, please state your name, number, and address for the record. The Arizona Open Meeting Law prohibits the commission from discussing or taking action on an item which is not listed on the prepared agenda. The commission members may, however, respond to criticism made by those addressing the commission, ask staff to review a matter, or ask that a matter be placed on a future agenda. Public comment should be limited to three minutes reading time. So do we have any public participation either in the chamber or virtually? Going once, going twice. Last call for public participation. Okay. We'll move on to item four, new business. And 4A is a update on capacity fee results from Aaron Young. So Aaron, the floor is yours. Good evening, commissioners. Um, Aaron Young, Water Resources Manager. I'm here to introduce Stantec, uh, presenting the title that you just read on capacity fees. Uh, the first thing I'd like to um, provide an overview of before Zach kicks it off is our uh, an outreach update. Um, Zach, could you, would you mind pulling up the slides? Thank you. Um, sure. You've made some requests, commissioners, for information that might help uh, you or the public uh, better understand um, some of what we're doing. So we have one new fact sheet that is on cleanwaterflagstaff.com. It's the Understanding Your Municipal Services Bill. Um, this isn't geared directly to the to the rate study. Uh, however, when we have another fact sheet that says what fees are being updated and we say water and sewer fees, we hope that this will help them understand how those are calculated. Um, as an example, um, we are in front of city council with this presentation on January 23rd. And then we'll be asking for their final direction on capacity fees on February 6th. Um, therefore, we've scheduled two drop-in opportunities for developers or those interested in capacity fees on uh, these dates, January 31st and February 5th. Uh, we'll be making a formal announcement and a formal invitation to fo for folks to, to join us um, tomorrow or, or early next week. Um, and we'll have some handouts ready for those, um, specifically on capacity fees. After capacity fees, we move into rate design and the water and sewer rates, and we'll touch on that schedule at the end of this presentation. Um, so with that, and unless you have any questions for me on outreach, I'll turn it over to Zach. not hearing anything, Zach. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to give some time for questions, but it sounds like we're good to go. Good to go. All right. 
Well, welcome everybody and thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners. My name is Zach Cook and I am a consultant economist with Stantec. Been working on this rate study with uh, staff and Carol and Audrey and just going to step through um, presentation that you've probably seen bits and pieces of and some of it uh, includes some updates on the, the study, namely related to capacity fees. So first we can go over the overview of the scope and where we're at in the tasks of the rate study. And then we'll we'll dive into where we're at in the capacity fee model and calculations with um, some draft results to review. And then we can go into discussion and, and questions. So this is the scope overview, the list of the seven tasks of the rate study. Um, we are here at task three in the cost of service analysis. Um, like Aaron mentioned, we're finalizing some capacity fee stuff and cost of service analyses before moving into rate design. Um, so like I said, I think a lot of this methodology and some of these slides that we're about to show you will have already seen once or maybe even twice but essentially the capacity fee calculation approach um, takes the system value whether that's existing or new um, components of the system or both and divides it by the total system capacity to get a capacity fee in terms of dollars per year ERU or gallons per day. Um, so the capacity fee approaches are the buy-in method, the incremental method, and the combined method, and I'm sure Carol has given um, really good explanations of these, so I won't go into too much detail unless there's any questions about the approaches. Um, but as you can see from this slide, the current approach for the capacity fees that are in place now is uh, the incremental method with the exception of wastewater treatment function. And typically, we want to select the methodology that fits with the capacity available either in the existing, existing system or in expansions to the system or both. So for Flagstaff's existing system and um, new growth related investments. I think we showed we've probably shown this table to you last time um, with some things in progress for uh, the incremental capacity, the total system value and the total system capacity. So this table after working with staff <clears throat> um, has been filled out with the incremental capacity for water and wastewater the total system value and the total system capacity, I believe are the changes that have been made since you've last seen this. So I'll kind of let you stare at the numbers for a little bit here. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and just wanted to note that the footnotes as well as you're kind of staring at this and, and digesting these numbers. The water fund capacity fees include the growth related reclaimed water distribution capital projects. Um, and then for the buy-in method approach and um, the combined approach as well for the total existing system value in terms of the fixed assets, we calculate that on a um, replacement cost new less depreciation basis. Uh, so that's just the second footnote. And the third footnote has to do with the incremental method and combined method. Um, the current Fee, uh, capacities and values do not include the future water supply projects or the advanced wastewater treatment plant expansion. So the values and the capacities you're seeing are excluding those. And um, I think you've probably all heard as well uh, in previous presentations of this information that staff and Stantec are recommending the combined method to capture the city's investment in existing uh, system, in the existing system plus the future growth related capital improvements. So for the uh, growth related you know, I, project. I did, I did have one question about the previous slide. Of course. Uh, I think I, 
Oh, you must have changed the slide. And the one that we had from last time, there was a level of service line and it had 266 gallons uh, per household per day. I was wondering where yeah. that number had come from, but maybe things have changed. No, that is that is actually coming up. That's in a, a slide that I'm about to get to and we'll walk through the level of service calculations as well. But that's a, a great question and really important for uh, understanding the fees and the, the methodology. So um, yes, we will get there in just a few slides here. Um, before we get to level of service, um, some new slides uh, that we've added here. This first one is related to water. And this slide shows the growth related projects, which are part of the capacity fee calculation. And are eligible to be paid for with capacity fees. So again, I'll just let you kind of stare at this list. Look at the projects um, and then you can see that the project cost uh, estimates as well as the percentage attributed to growth that the project will um, accommodate. And therefore the, the percentage of the project that's eligible to be paid for by capacity fees for the water fund. Zach, just to clarify, the last line is the total, right? Or is that a whole nother like off the chart number? <laughs> I believe this is a uh, whole nother number. The future water supply projects. I think it's uh, Red Gap Ranch. Um, okay, but Ed, Aaron or Shannon can correct me if I'm wrong there. No, you, that, that, I get it. I get it. I just, okay. just trying to make sure I understood what it was. Yeah, it is a, a, a big number relative to the, the the rest, right? And you can tell by the the font size. <laughs> um, cool. So yeah, and this these slides will be made available. You can um, you know read over the. The project, the growth related project list for water. I also want to show the wastewater growth related project list. Same thing, just let you stare at these projects for a second here and look at the project costs um, and the percentage growth associated with the project costs that are eligible to be paid for with capacity fees. And here again, we have a, a large project, the wastewater advanced treatment plan expansion that is uh, additional, not a sum. So the under percent growth, that's the growth you're estimating in capacity that will be needed. That is the percentage of the. Um, the, the percentage of the project cost that will be accommodating growth, projected growth. Yeah. And the very next slide now goes into um, the level of service question that was previously asked. I think this is probably the slide you were referring to. Um, so to start off with with the level of service conversation, we can just start with the water fund and there's there's two ways to to look at the level of service um, that we've been modeling, which will result in four. Um, options for the capacity fee. The first level of service um, standard that we're looking at is based on the city code design standards, um, which is for water, a level of service of 100 gallons per day times 3.5 people per household times a 2.5 peak day peaking factor. And that results in 875 gallons per day as the level of service. Now, <clears throat> the city code and the design standards uh, don't necessarily reflect the most recent data of actual use. So we also looked at actual use data to calculate um, an alternative level of service that can be used for the capacity fee uh, calculation, where we used census data to get a people per household estimate. Um, and then we used the uh, 93 gallons per capita gallons per capita per day of average total use and a 1.5 <clears throat> peaking peak day peaking factor um, using actual uh, production data. And so that results in the level of service for water of 335 gallons per day, um, which is obviously a, a lot lower than the design standards from the city code. And uh, using more recent data as well. 
How is commercial worked into this? Or I should say non-residential. Um, in this particular number here, it is based on residential um, average people per household and use per household. Um, but I think um, maybe Aaron or Shannon or Carol could speak to um, how the commercial classes are um, involved or, or get capacity fees applied to them. Uh, we're, we're going to show a list by a meter size in a few slides as well, though. We just saw you, Carol, if you want to take that question. <laughs> Thank you and good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry, I'm at an airport, which is why Zach is stepping in and helping us out. And I'm sorry for any background noise, but I will just talk really briefly about non-residential level of service. Whenever we're calculating capacity fees, we put everything on an equivalent residential unit basis. And so that level of service is associated with um, typical residential demands, peak day demands. We then associate that equivalent residential unit with a three quarter inch water meter. So any non-residential customer who has a three quarter inch water meter is assumed to have that same demand characteristic. If they have a larger meter, then we base their capacity fee on a, a factor that is according to the hydraulic capacity of that larger meter size. As Zach said, you'll see later that we'll show you a schedule for the fees that are based on different sizes of meters and reflect higher demands. When we get to the wastewater side, we know that some customers have different characteristics when they're large, say large industries, or specific type of manufacturers, we recommend that those levels of service and the associated fee are, are customized and hand calculated so that we get a, a better estimate of the demands placed on your system. So that's essentially, in a nutshell, how we accommodate non-residential customers into this capacity fee calculation. Excellent. Thank you for that elegant explanation, Carol. Um, yeah, so the, the level of service that you're seeing here, like Carol said, is based on residential usage, but we scale it up um, for the fee, which we will go over shortly. Um, but yeah, great question. On the wastewater side, um, same thing. We have a design standard city code level of service, but then also an alternative level of service calculation using actual use data uh, in both for wastewater in terms of flow and loadings and so you'll see some scenarios um, or options for capacity fees um, in a couple slides that um, are calculated just based on flow and then some options that are calculated on flow plus loadings and for wastewater the uh, level of service under the city code to get to the the flow number for 420 gallons per day uses 75 gallons per day times 3.5 people per household times the 1.6 uh, peak day peaking factor, whereas the actual use uh, data uses 67 gallons per day from the annual report uh, times 2.4 people per household from the census data, the most recent census data, times the same 1.6 peak day peaking factor. So that's the distinction between the 420 and the 257. And then, as like I said, as you'll see, we, we have a flow plus loadings option as well for wastewater. So for water, the um, options, the, the four options that we have for capacity fees are made distinct by the different levels of service, like we just looked at, the actual data versus the design standards. But then also we have options that include the future water supply project for Red Gap and options that exclude the future water supply projects. So that results in four options that we've labeled option 1A, 1B, 2A, and 2B. Before we go into the preliminary draft results, I um, want to just give this opportunity to to Aaron and staff um, to talk about future water supply needs. So um, I'll hand it off to you, Aaron. 
Thanks, Zach. Um, I believe it was um, one, well, Commissioner Nauman, I think it was you who asked uh, when we would need a new water supply, what the current timing was. So I thought I'd introduce our kind of more recent um, projections. Uh, this graph we've seen many times, it's just our, our base case scenario um, showing our most recent uh, gallons per capita. In this case, we used a six year average GPCD rate on the left. Uh, in 2022, we, pr we provided about 10,000 acre feet of water to the community. Um, then we can grow sort of the projection of water demand based on the population growth rate and holding that six year average GPCD rate into the future. Uh, so with these assumptions of our last decadal average population growth rate of 1.4% and that 95 gallons per capita, that curve is you know population growth and water demand. Um, and then the supplies are the different colors. Uh, assuming about 2,000 acre feet of water from Upper Lake Mary. And these, um, the three bottom colors are designation of adequate water supplies approved by ADWR. So the blue Upper Lake Mary, uh, the purple is continuing our current reclaimed water deliveries of 2,200 acre feet. Um, we, as you know, we don't have really any reclaimed water to grow on in the summer, which is when most of the demand is. So. And then the brown colors are our uh, local groundwater. So our Woody Mountain Wellfield, Lake Mary Wellfield, and, and local inner city wells. And the um, we have 9,900 acre feet in our designation for local groundwater supplies. Um, so using those projections, we would need a new water source in 2051 based on these assumptions. Um, our build out population in our regional plan, depending on what density model you look at, uh, we're assuming 178,000 population here um, at, in 100 years. The next slide, Zach. Oh, and we have one question. So where did the number for um, recharge come from? The numbers of recharge, uh, so we have an estimated natural recharge that lower, lowermost brown with the dashed above it, that's about 3,000 acre feet a year. That is um, the amount of water we discharge out of, um, or I'm sorry, that is natural recharge. That is a number I calculated based on the uh, watershed, the contributing watershed to the groundwater supplies that we're pumping right now. So that's about, uh, that's assuming, you know, our average rainfall over that area. And then the recovered reclaim water uh, volume of uh, 1150 acre feet a year is the volume we discharge from the Rio de Flag water reclamation facility. That's up gradient of several wells. The volume we discharge out of the Wildcat Hill facility isn't recoverable. So that's why that number is not here. Um, so the darker brown above that we estimate is, is potentially mining groundwater, which leads me to the next slide. In this scenario, um, we're assuming the same population growth rate holds into the future and our same uh, water use rate holds into the future. What we're seeing in our local hydrographs, so pump our, our water levels over time in our pumping wells, the Lake Mary well field is uh, dewatering. We're not seeing recovery rates to, to keep up with pumping. Uh, so we'll ha potentially have to do some shifting where we're either pumping from different areas of the local aquifer or it might trigger, you know, a, a new water source. Um, that, and if we were to lose Upper Lake Mary to a wildfire, um, we would need a new water source much, you know, closer in time. So with this scenario, we're showing 2039. Um, the reason we bring this up is one of the options for capacity fees on water is whether we start collecting money now for that new water supply. 
Um, Zach had $230 million. Um, Red Gap is potentially, you know, double that, let's say. Uh, direct portable reuse is a couple hundred thousand dollar investment. So um, if we just collect maybe half of what we need um, now, that'll will be um, in a much better position to fund one of these projects in the hopefully, you know, the nearer term than if we weren't collecting capacity fees to fund infrastructure. Uh, any water supply project we move forward with would go through city council. So we provided these to help um, with the decision on whether to collect capacities for a new project. Any questions on that? So if I'm reading this right, um, and 16 years, worst case scenario, we could be needing another large water source. Yes, um, and I should have mentioned the 9,900 acre feet, we're still drilling new wells locally uh, to utilize 100% of that at some point. Um, today we're um, up to about 8,000 acre feet is what we produce out of that, the brown part out of the local groundwater. So there are four new wells in the next 10 year CIP, uh, I think partially funded by growth. So I think maybe one way to characterize. Are the funds allocated for that future drilling? Yes. Okay. Sorry, Commissioner Dudley. Hey, so Aaron, I think what, one way to say this, I don't know why I call this worst case scenario. This is just a more conservative scenario. As you said, if there's a giant fire or something that could <laughs> kick in something worse, but so a, a little bit more conservative model. Do, I. I personally would hope that we could get to more of a formula of when to start triggering fees with some of the main variables being the length of time to build slash produce whatever that option is, whether it's Red Gap Branch or a DPR, you know, IPR type option. So whatever, what's the timeline to build and then some sort of pre buffer, if you will, of time, let's call it five years, seven, eight, nine years in terms of when we would want to start implementing a fee so it's not all hitting fast and furious on the first day of construction, if you will. Um, I'm curious to the team, to our consulting team, if that's a rational mode that other municipalities use, um, sort of, you know, a, a, a saving time, a collecting time, and then figuring in construction and, and development time. Carol, would you like to take that question? I think I can. So Kurt, we, you know, the in our experience, there's no set formula for when you can start collecting the fees because we're only projecting a certain amount of growth over time. And so if we knew that there were going to be X number of new connections tomorrow, you know, we'd, we could then determine what that optimal time might be. So as it is, the, the way growth is expected to occur over time, we're only going to be collecting a small portion for this project, for one of these projects, you know, and since the timeline to when exactly that project might be started, that is uncertain as well. So the, the point is to start collecting a smaller amount of the fee for this project. So you'd have the whole capacity fee, but only a portion of it would be for this long-term water supply. Set it aside for that moment when you are going to start the design and construction of these projects so that you have something in reserve. So that it's the uncertainty of when you're going to collect for or when you're going to add new accounts or new connections, and then when you're going to build the project. We have a client in Colorado that has a 50-year plan, and their long-term water resources plan out 50 years includes projects that are going to expand capacity, and they're collect they've been collecting for several years and set aside a portion of those capacity fees for that long-term project. 
or those long-term projects. So it's a it's a um, practice that is in place in a lot of utilities, particularly in the West. Yeah, and uh, reserve building in general is something that we encourage and, and see a lot. And uh, particularly in, in Arizona, some of the municipalities we work with, a lot of times the reserve building tactics are for future water resources. So it is. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I, I think we've just got to be a little mindful that we're going to probably have to get into reserve setting for water for source production as well as sewage and so we're going to be potentially double whammy <laughs> and, and i think we it's also something we need to think about with city council to make sure those funds are absolutely ring fast ring fenced and once they're collected they don't end up in the general fund <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure the city manager will tell us how we can do that and how that's done and that would never happen so i'll just set that aside yeah. Question. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to institute, say, tiered rate structures on non-residential, how would that affect this curve? That would impact our GPCD projection of what we would expect, how we would expect the water used to be reduced and that is part of our water conservation strategic plan work where uh you know we used a, a, a firm an expert in water conservation um response to things like that to develop a gpcd reduction for a whole bunch of interventions that we could make to keep reducing that uh, rate so we'll we'll get into that with um rate design yeah, I just know when we, when the water group has looked at this, you can push out the need for new water sources by decades sometimes. So, which we have, and there's a point where we won't probably really be able to go any lower. That's what the water conservation strategic plan helped us determine, and that number was for total like I think 80 GPCD. Um, Well, I mean, there are other options, but it, it requires, you know, give and take on how people are using water, not just residential, but everybody in the city. And it could be a challenge and uh, something that would have to be done over a long period. So. necessarily have any other comments the 80 gpcd target was over a 20 year period i think and i'll have to confirm those numbers but we will talk about that in rate design um, one more caveat to kind of a formula is when there's a window for federal funding and becoming maybe uh, getting an authorized project and you have to have money to be able to do that I think that's an important part of this as well. And that's all I have, Zach, so you can continue. OK, uh, one more one more quick thing on this, like looking at the resiliency scenario. I mean, Red Gap Ranch has been going on for a long time and 15, 16 years is very far from now. So. The risk of fire is high. There's all these there's all these things that are built into that, and so yeah, backing out to know at what point just for Red Gap the trigger point needs to happen for that really moving forward. I, I think would be, and maybe that's what you're getting to and stuff. But um, if you don't start uh, saving for that resiliency plan. Now you're going to shoot yourself in the foot, I think. Um, Mr. Chair, if I may, I just kind of Commissioner Loverich, I, I think you're you're hitting the point right on. When you, I feel like when you work through the process of the of the financial planning and the rate model, a project of that magnitude and that time frame out is not going to show up in your financial planning until probably ten years. 
by the time it shows up in your financial model, the impact is going to be very substantial. Because these are on our radar and we can and we're looking ahead, maybe not exact year, but we know that there's a need and we can begin to curve that impact by um, by beginning to collect a smaller amount now, allowing that to compound during that time um, creates less strain when the project does show up in your 10 year plan and you're doing your rate study and your so your capacity fees, the scenarios that that Stantec is presenting is again both where it's not in our 10 year plan, uh, small portions of it, but not the large magnitude. And so those are options that we could move forward with that would not collect capacity fees for that more long term. I think to your point is exactly what we're pointing out is there is an option that we could look further ahead and take a more conservative approach to begin uh, chipping away at that and and lessen the impact in the future. And I think what you're touching on is exactly the options that Stantac is is trying to facilitate the discussion. So I, I appreciate your your framing that for us. Is the, is the city, I, I can remember over time, there's been a um, searching for partners in this project, Red Gap Ranch. What's the status of all that? Yeah, I, I don't think that's changed. It's, it's not something that's front and center right now with everything else going on. Right. You know, a, a good graphic always results in good discussions. So I think these were really good graphics. Um, are we ready to move to the next slide or are there any more questions or comments here? I think you can move forward, Zach. Thank you. Um, so similar looking flowchart to the, the water options for um, capacity fees, uh, except for with wastewater, we have eight options rather than four. Um, with the, the, the distinguishing factors being the level of service between actual data and the city code design standards, but then also breaking out uh, options for using only flow and flow plus loadings in pounds per day. And that results in options 1A through 2D. Um, and I do apologize, these should say uh, no wastewater treatment plant expansion project rather than future water supply project. Um, so apologize for the confusion there, um, but the options under each gray bar here are distinguishing between no wastewater treatment plant expansion or uh, funding the wastewater treatment plant expansion. So that's the resulting eight options for capacity fees for wastewater. Before we look at the preliminary draft results for all of these options for water and wastewater, just want to present the, the current fees for water and sewer system capacity fees based on meter size. Um, and to address the, the commercial question earlier, um, these are currently and would be um, in the future based on meter size regardless of customer class. So as Carol explained, we use the, the level of service um, on an equivalent residential unit basis and scale the capacity fees linearly by meter size. So as we can see, the water capacity fee for a three quarter inch meter right now is 5,728 and the sewer capacity fee is 3,723. <clears throat> So for water, um, the capacity fee options using the combined methodology. We have uh, presented the three quarter inch residential meter fees, the existing fees and our calculated fees for options 1A through 2B. And we also are presenting a two inch commercial meter. Um, the same thing, existing fees and then the four fees under options 1A through 2B. Um, so you can see using a level of service with actual recent data uh, with no future water supply and new groundwater capacity. The new calculated fee would be 
6,507. 6, and if the actual data is used for level of service, but the future water supply and new groundwater capacity is included, the calculated fee is 8,146. And uh, the numbers are scaled linearly for the two inch commercial meter. Using the city code design standards level of service, um, the calculated fees are much higher because of the higher level of service. So with no future water supply and no new groundwater capacity under the city code design standards, we're going from 5,728 to 17,341. And if we include the future water supply and new groundwater capacity, that number is 21,603. Um, so, as you can kind of stare at this compared to the residential meter to the commercial meter, um, also want to present all of the meter sizes with the existing number of accounts, the existing fee for that meter size, and both options 1A and 1B, which are calculated fees resulting from the level of service based on the actual usage data. So, most of the customers obviously are residential three quarter inch meters, but we can see that there are a fair amount of the two inch commercial customers, um, a fair amount of one inch meters. And we can compare the calculated fees using actual data and keep in mind option 1B is including the um, future water supply and groundwater costs. And on the wastewater side, it's a little bit more of a complex looking table since there's eight options rather than four. So I'll try to leave this up here um, for a few moments so that you can stare at it and digest the numbers. Keeping in mind that the top half of the table is using the actual flow and the actual flow plus loadings from recent data and compares a three quarter inch residential meter fee to a two inch commercial meter fee. Um, the actual <clears throat> uh, level of service using flow only increases the fee for uh, option 1A with no wastewater treatment plan expansion from 3,723 to 4,203 and just a, you know, $46 higher uh, if we include the wastewater treatment plant expansion <clears throat> for the three quarter inch meter. If we use flow plus loadings in pounds per day, the fees are a little bit lower. Uh, the calculated fees uh, pretty close to the current fee actually um, without the wastewater treatment plant expansion and with the wastewater treatment plant expansion. And then the bottom half of the table is using the city code design standards uh, flow only. So um, for 2A and 2B and flow plus loadings for 2C and 2D. So the impact of the big project on the water side is a little bit higher in terms of the calculated fees than on the wastewater side. Um, those fees are, are relatively close. But um, same thing as the water uh, slide I just wanted to show. All of the meter sizes, the existing fees, and the options, uh, the calculated fees of option 1A through 1D using the actual data uh, for level of service. Again, I'll just leave this up for a moment or two here to let you digest the, the numbers and the information. And then we'll look at the um, benchmarking of capacity fees pairing by ERU. Any questions for Zach? Yeah, the only question I have would um, be nice to have a little comparison in this chart of actual you know, volume flow for each meter, the maximum, maybe the average use and the maximum. 
uh, just to get an idea of what that meter size means in terms of water use. Sure, that's a great suggestion. Um, maybe we can add a, a column or two to include the average flow and the hydraulic capacity of these meters. Hey, Zach, can you go back to the fresh water table like this? And this I'm, one. I'm, I just had a short circuit in my brain, which is <laughs> if, if I think back to the table of all the projects you had, you know, we had various things listed out within the 230 million at the bottom is the big, the big number, right? So if I add all that up, let's call it 350 million. I'm making up a number, but 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 the the exercise here is to set the fees such that we can achieve that some or all, and we'll figure out how much of that 350 million over a specific amount of time, right? Yeah, I, I think the philosophy and and Carol, uh, Shannon, or Aaron, feel free to step in at any time here. But I think that the philosophy of using the combined methodology is to basically charge um, a capacity fee that both captures uh, the existing system assets so that a new connection is is buying into the the existing capacity and the, the value of the assets while also um, contributing towards the capital improvement projects that are occurring because of the need for okay. um, for bigger capacity because of okay. new customers. OK, so so. There's kind of two numbers, there's the buy in for current and then there's the prepay for for the, the expansion. And those numbers should be relative. Actually, I think I flip back to and so the. I'm just trying to think through the formula real quick. So when you're using actual flow, the bottom of the formula at a lower number, shouldn't that be the higher of the two? Because versus when you have more flow? Anyway, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is you're ultimately trying to cover, Every time you connect, you want to cover a certain por portion of existing and a certain portion of new. And so why does water flow get into that? Because these are all capital projects, which aren't hmm. flow related. Uh, I'm, I'm probably not making sense, but it. No, but I'm, I'm, I, I think I understand your question. And I think what. Um, I think what the important number on this table to look at is when we, again we've been showing the combined method results is the um, total system capacity flow in millions of gallons per day and this uh, becomes important because we can look at in the buy-in method the existing capacity in flow in millions of gallons per day right at 16.9 but these the incremental method which become um, when combined with the buy-in method obviously becomes the combined method adds this incremental capacity because of the new projects that increase our capacity so in effect the fee captures the cost of adding to the system capacity and that incremental is rather expensive relative to the buy-in because the buy-in has been over time and it's built up the capability to 16.9 but the 209 is really just the 209 is really just buying you the 1.53 uh, right? actually so yes i i see i think i see where the confusion is coming from the the actual total system value that we use in the um numerator of the equation, the total system value, is in the combined method um, actually just this 181 plus the 70.5, the expansion related CIP. These are just the costs of the project that expand the capacity, which are these projects. 
which and that's why there's a percentage growth associated with each because they expand the capacity of the system to accommodate growth. But that's yeah, great question. It is confusing to think through and step through. So I, I think that was uh, helpful for everyone to. To hear and think through. Okay. Does that Thank make you. more sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Sorry for right. everybody off on my rabbit hole. Could you oh, go back no. on that slide for a second? Absolutely. Uh, the project one or this one? The project one. Yep. What is the bottleneck project? That's the reclaim upsizing from the old eight inch. And now you're going to ask why reclaim is in there. I, that was my question. <laughs> Carol, you explained this really well. Are you, how's the airport? <laughs> I'll give it a try. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the, in your full entire water system, the amount of improvements that you are planning for your water system are affected by how much reclaimed water you sell, right? And how much, and, and the reclaimed water you produce. You do not charge a capacity fee to your reclaimed water customers. In fact, you have the same reclaimed water customers who are under or who have contracts for a set amount of water that they can purchase. So you don't have new reclaimed water customers that you are charging for those projects. However, those projects benefit your entire water system. So we include the value of those distribution related projects in the water system capacities. It was done that way the last study as well, and probably before that. I asked the same questions many times. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Any other questions for Zach? Uh, Zach, I, I seem to think at the end of your presentation, you have what the capacity fees are for those other methods. Um, I'm let me make sure I found here's where we left off, I think. Um, so yes, we, we have screenshots of the model for all of the methods before we get into those or, or further um, discussion if needed. Just want to show the capacity fee comparison per ERU um, using the um, three quarter inch as the, the baseline for ERUs um, in a group of about 10 to 12 peers here to 12, I think. Um, and I can tell you that we've worked with um, at least two other municipalities on this uh, list in the previous years that are also looking at increasing the capacity fees that you're seeing here. Um, and that is all I have for discussion. And uh, Aaron, we can get into those screenshots and look at the fees uh, under the other approaches, but um, we also have a next steps slide that I don't want to skip over. Um, if you want to talk about next steps and dates or something like that, or if you'd prefer to go right to the, the screenshots, that's fine as well. Uh, sure. Um, well, the screenshots, I thought they might help with Chairman Riegelman's questions on okay. how, yeah, if we were to use the go with the buy in or incremental, how that impacts the capacity fee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the, the panel of our model that calculates all three of these approaches um, simultaneously um, shows the single ERU. Um, I'm not sure if you all can see my mouse and I realize I've, I've been using my mouse as a pointer on my note screen <laughs> for most of this presentation. So hopefully you can see where I'm pointing now. Um, the water buy-in approach for option 1A when compared to the incremental approach and the combined approach still under option 1A, uh, you can see for the buy-in approach when we exclude those expansion related capital projects the fee actually goes down under option 1a um, and if we're exclusively if we're excluding the 
existing asset values and only using the expansion related capital projects, the current fee nearly doubles. <clears throat> and with the combined approach, um, the fee increases 16% under option 1A. And we have, I'm, I'm sure you all get these uh, slides um, both digitally and printed, and we have this exact slide for all four options for water, option 1B, option 2A, and 2B, and then we have the same for all eight options for wastewater capacity fees as well. So you can kind of look over the different approach uh, calculated fees for all of our options. Zach, I think, and I think Carol was saying though, but just a buy-in only is not really feasible because you've still got to deal with growth and future. Yeah, and right exactly. Ahead. But, but I, I, I get why you do it for mathematical purposes and for illustration purposes, but that's not really an option, right? Um, I I think uh, staff and Stan Tech are recommending the combined approach to sort of capture the value of the existing um, assets and the growth related projects, but technically it's an option under. Um, yeah, technically. Yeah. AWWA, but, but yes, you, you yeah. want to capture the value of future and existing. Yep, agree, agree. So by the buy in method, if you didn't do anything, you just use the buy in method. Would that decrease every year? One point I think Carol was trying to make is we're not comparing apples to apples here necessarily with the buy in because um, the current fee was based on the incremental approach in the last study. Yes. So we're not looking at what the buy in was in the last study. So that's kind of important to. Yeah, we'd have back to go and back. pull out those figures to compare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because infrastructure is going to depreciate. So technically, if you're just looking at that, it would just go down every year. Right. So one question on this is, you know, we're looking at actual level, actual use level of service versus the city code. What is used right now, and what? Stantec, what do you guys recommend on that? Like, is that up for debate? Are you guys trying to figure that out? That is a question we will be asking City Council. And at the end of this, I thought I'd bring up the exact questions we'll be asking of City Council. That is one of them. And Stantec is prepared to share what their recommendation is on that. So I'll let Zach do that. Um, the, yeah. Sorry, Sorry, Zach, to interrupt, just noting the previous study used N actual. We couldn't, I don't know that we could replicate each number. In this case, we're documenting where each number comes from for the actual. Okay, cool. I, so I see you answered that before <laughs> on this slide. So yeah, that makes yes. sense. These are all... Um, recommendations from the AWWA M1 manual, the principles of water rates, fees and charges. So um, the level of service industry guidance, uh, these bullets here are definitely um, defensive methods for estimating and calculating level of service. Carol, did you wanna speak on this real quick? I can, I apologize, I've taken myself off. Can you hear me okay? Yes, so we recommend using the actual use. While we we have often used the design standards for the level of service, we understand that that, that uh, code information hasn't been updated since about the 1980s. So when we are looking at actual use data to validate and to support those design standards, we find that so we, it needs to be lowered, or we would recommend it would be those standards could be lowered. So the actual use metrics are preferable to the design standards in this case. Yep, and that is... Um, all we've got to present today. So thank you, commissioners. Um, 
thanks everybody for for participating and listening. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Carol, Aaron. Aaron, did you have any uh, capstone thoughts on that, or should we proceed to the next item? Well, I actually, now that I I think about it, it would. This is the only time you will be seeing capacity fees before it goes to council and before we ask for their direction. And if you uh, would allow me, I can pull up the um, questions. Basically, we're asking council. I have it ready to pull up on my screen. And if you wanted to give a recommendation from the commission on any or all of those, um, I'm sure council would really appreciate your input. I'm not sure we really agendized it this way. Um, because this is sort of a, a fast moving. Uh, yeah, I think we had this, this, this was an information update, not a vote item, right? Or a support item. Yeah, it sounds like it was an informational item. So I'm not sure if we could even take informal recommendation from the commission. Why don't we do this? If you've got a quick summary of the questions that are actually going to go to the, the council, city council, then individual uh, commissioners can think through <laughs> how they feel about that. And they may have uh, feelings that they could send to Marion where we can aggregate that. And then you can look at that. Uh, this is our uh, agenda item that was just approved today that will show up in council's packet for the 23rd. It just we got populated today. Um, number one is whether to proceed with Stantec and staff's recommendation to follow the combined methodology. Number two is whether to use the system actuals as the basis for level of service um, to proceed with staff and Stantec's recommendation on that. Number three would be whether to collect the capacity fees towards the cost of the future water supply infrastructure or not. Number four, uh, collect capacity fees towards the cost of the new wastewater treatment facility. And last would be to include or not to include the loadings capacity as a basis for calculating the level of service. Typically, it's only flow, but in Flagstaff, a driver is at this point in time is certainly loadings. I have a little question on that uh, comparison to other communities in our service area. Is was that upgraded since the last time we saw it, or is that the a repeat? Zach, I think that's a repeat. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually ask to put the year by each when each of that those studies were collected so we would know how old they are. Because the older they are, the less representative they're going to be. Yeah, because a couple of meetings ago, we the information then was it was maybe current for us, but not maybe the rest of them. And so it's worthless then when it's not up to date, but I would really love to see a com that comparison that make sure that we're not uh, charging uh, enough. <laughs> Zach, do you happen to know the date since I think you pulled that information? Is that real current information or do you not? The dates know? of just the actual use? Of our comparison to other communities. Oh, um, yeah, those are um, in effective, I, I believe, November 2023. So some things may have changed. And like I said, I know um, two of the Queen Creek and Pagos Area Water and Sewer District we've been uh, working with um, on capacity fee studies and looking at uh, increased fees as well. So the information is kind of fluid. Uh, it's changing. Some of these places are increasing their fees as well. Um, but yes, that's a we we can put uh, an edit to that slide, the benchmarking slide that puts the effective dates um, on all those utilities, so that you can track that. 
another thing that might be useful. I noticed a lot of those cities in the Phoenix area, do they rely on CIP water or not? Mm -hmm. And what will be the effect um, of shortages in that system in the future? And that's going to obviously, I think they're paying a lot less because they're basically getting subsidized by CIP water. Um, but I don't know for sure. I haven't really looked at it, but. Yeah, uh, the the criteria for this list was actually one of the criterion for the list was uh, groundwater rather than surface water use. So all of those utilities are um, to some extent using groundwater. Um, it's really difficult to compare these with other. I mean, uh, the Valley cities, they're all doing all kind, you know, so many different projects right now. Some haven't pumped their groundwater systems in 30 years because of they've been on CAP water. So I guess I would recommend we don't put too much um, into the comparison, although I totally understand why that's important. Um, I guess what I'm saying is you need to compare apples to apples. Yeah, it's we're groundwater and surface water here in rural Arizona communities. So maybe comparing with other rural Arizona communities might be a better comparison. I don't know. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, commissioners, um, I, I, I think Aaron's touching on it where it is important to pull, like people do want to see the comparatives, right? How do we compare to other, uh, to other communities? Uh, Stentech early walked through the decision of how we determine the comparables. There were criteria, high mountain, we're looking for high mountain, um, educational institutes within the communities, um, the water supply sources, but even those aren't apples to apples, right? It's it's a comparison. And I think if you were setting your rates based on, again, we're going to charge the same as another community, like that becomes more valuable for the rate study. But really, there's a process that goes through the, the cost of service and how you distribute that cost. And then you're just doing a check against because people are going to want to know, well, how does this compare to what other community? Um, I think, yeah, looking for the apples to apples was I mean, we had a pretty intense conversation. Well, how do you find the exact comparable to any community? And so they did try to they try to pull some that have similarities. And so, again, some of those and Stantec could go through the list again, but it was High Mountain, the water source, where they come from, educational institutes. Um, but yeah, finding one place that matches all of them, I, I think would be near impossible. And I think just a continuation of for the chair, just point of order, Marion did point out um, on the agenda, this item is listed as new business. Um, it's none of the informational. And then within the staff summary, it does allow where staff is um, requesting input on the update, um, saying staff seeks input. So again, while it may not be a decision that we're asking you to vote on something, I think it is very well within um, within the realm of what we're talking about to to provide input to staff that we can also communicate to to the council. Thank you for that. Just like a comment on number four, uh, facet fees, capacity fees for um, wastewater treatment facility. So we have a bond out. Um, how does that interplay with this? Uh, yes, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Nolan, I, um, Stan can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but so the projects that are bond funded on the CIP, the rate model assumes everything that we have in the works now gets completed and associates it that way. Um, so again, I think that's my that's my belief of how they handled that um, in the model. Does that kind of answer your question of how that plays in? And I do see Carol reappeared. Mm -hmm. We have. Thank you, Shannon. I, one thing that I want to mention, I assume that you're talking about the bond project that is external to rates and fees, that it's paid for externally, property taxes, something not from capacity fees. So that project does not factor into our capacity fee model. The costs do not come into the calculation of the fees. So is, is that a correct understanding of what you're referring to? Yeah, I was just wondering. So we're we're talking about like the current plant that is needs to be built, like the, because of the solids issue that needs Correct. to be completed in two years, which is like twenty-seven million. 
And that uh, there is a solids project that is about twenty six million dollars that is already included in the in this calculation for the capacity fees. That is currently is a, a loan, so I, maybe I misunderstood you. So that project is included, and we are assuming that capacity fees can help pay off that debt for that loan. You might have to turn your camera off, and we might be able to hear you better. Oh, so that that was unclear. Y yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry I, about that. I heard you, Carol. Zach, I can okay, reiterate good. it if you can. Um, okay, so. Uh, the Rio solids treatment plant is on the list. I could pull up the growth related wastewater projects list as well, uh, if that would be helpful. But that project cost right now is estimated 24.7 million. Um, and all of it, uh, all of the costs is assumed to be allocated towards growth um, to accommodate growth. And there, our understanding is there's there's a loan for that project. But the capacity fees collected through uh, wastewater connections will help repay that debt. Um, I was just looking at the difference between uh, freshwater and wastewater. Seems like the increase is a lot lower for wastewater. Um, is that because we have a bond out to do a lot of the expensive? improvements at the uh, wildcat plant right now or why is that i think it's partially due to the magnitude of the growth related projects and the costs of those projects um, there's a lot more growth related projects on the water side and um, i think a, a sum would have been uh, actually good to add to this table to show the, the total, but I have that somewhere here as well. So uh, the total system values um, for water versus wastewater, when we use the um, replacement costs, uh, new less depreciation plus the expansion related capital, the total system value for water is 252.3 million, whereas wastewater it's 161.7 million. So that numerator's um, a lot smaller. And uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, if I could, I would also think, and again, Zach can correct me if I'm wrong, but when you look at the order of magnitude, especially when you look at the future projects that we're, we're discussing, whether you include for capacities, uh, two projects very similar in dollar amounts, right around the 250 million each, uh, but when you look at the capacity that it brings, um, how many millions of gallons, that's also a difference, right? From going from a, a 6 million gallon a day plant, for example, to a 15, right? You gain about 9 million gallons as opposed to um, the future water supply, how many millions of gallons that that brings. So those are also not apples to apples on what that investment brings back as far as capacity. I think there's a delta there. What is the ex expected capacity of Red Gap Branch when it comes online? Is that I can vaguely remember like 8 million gallons per day or something. 18. Yeah, but so I think that Zach went back. Build out. Yeah, Zach went back to the slide because I know we assigned a value for the water future water demand, and I believe we had a value in there, right? The 16. Oh, the, I thought it was you, 18. Sorry. Are you talking we about? We do. We do. Audrey, do you have the model handy? You can tell us what that incremental capacity is. I can open it up super quick. And while that's opening, um, yeah, the combined method uh, you can see right here. Hopefully you can see my mouse. The total system value difference between water and wastewater fund when using the combined method. And then as as Shannon mentioned as well, the the total uh, system capacity, right? And the incremental capacity, the the. 
expansion related um, project capacity gain from these projects. 1.53 million, gal million gallons per day on the water side and no added capacity um, in terms of hydraulic flow on the wastewater side. I think that 1.53 on the water is our four wells. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. And a couple of the water line upsized projects. So the, this doesn't include a future water supply capacity. Chair, this is Council Member Sweet. Can I make a comment? Sorry, I was on mute. Please, Council Member, go ahead. Great, thank you. I am going to recommend, if possible, that you give your recommendation for the five questions that are going to be coming our way. I think it would be helpful. We rely heavily on your thoughts and having that piece of information for Tuesday would be beneficial. Yeah, I was just thinking through how to do that. Can we, Aaron, can we put those back up? And I think maybe we can do this in the, in the negative, which is, for example, on item one, uh, does anybody disagree with you? Do any of the commissioners disagree with, based on what we know today, based on this is guidance, not thou shalt. Um, does anybody disagree with suggesting that we use the combined methodology for calculating capacity fees? And if if you do disagree, why don't you say yes at this point? And if not, we'll just say we, we basically support that direction, right? But does anybody not support that direction? I support it, but um... I'm a little I'm, I'm curious what would happen when we get to the point when we talk about um, rate structures, tiered rates for commercial, you know, or non residential, how that affects the overall planning of this event. I know that's almost impossible to do, but um, it could change the picture. So I'm, it's like you're maybe it's just too many options to think about, not just. So I'd be a yes. Yeah, I'm thinking you know, directionally, do we all agree that or feel comfortable with combined methodology? I do personally, but anybody have any other negatives on that? Okay. Did I did it I miss a question or anything just now? Okay. Who who's I? Was that Carol? No, that was Aaron. I'm sorry. And I oh, thought sorry. you were staring at me, but you're not because you're on the screen, but no, I, no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm scary. I'm staring at the screen, not you. OK, number two, <laughs> um, utilizing system actual versus, um, excuse me, utilize system actuals as a basis for the level of service calculations as opposed to design. Does anybody have a an issue with that direction of using the system actuals? It seems kind of logical. Okay. Um, now we don't know how much or when, but the direction of collecting capacity fees for the future water supply infrastructure, such as Red Gap. Does anybody have any issues or disagreements with that direction? This is Malcolm. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Malcolm. Yeah, I guess I, I kind of do. Um, I'm thinking that the ratepayers are going to be faced with a huge increase in their water bills across the board. Um, so since we revisit this uh, rate study every handful of years, I think it should be put off so as to minimize the, um, in, the impact to, to the ratepayers. Um, of course, I don't know how much that is. Maybe they can answer the question, but also, um, I don't know if everybody's on board with direct potable reuse and indirect pot potable reuse projects. So it just seems to be quite a quite a leap there. I'm not sure about. Okay. Anybody else have an issue 
with the, that direction, whether it's DPR, IPR, or Red Gap? Well, that, that's why I brought up the capacity of that upsizing thing up for reclaimed water. If that would be related in a way uh, to, to support IPR, DPR, I'd be much more in favor of that uh, step. Um, I know water is water, and we're using reclaimed water to lower the potable water need. Um, but um, we probably ultimately really need to keep lowering that peak in the summer. We need to drive that down as far down as it will go. Um, um, because we really cannot build that much additional capacity in to the systems in the future, I think. But and if if you do that, you can do IPR DPR more easily. So, but yeah, I, I, I'm. We there's only four million dollars in this budget that I noticed for Red Gap Ranch, but there is nothing in there for development and planning for advanced water treatment. So. That would be my qualm with this plan. So, 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 John, the one thing I might uh, suggest is that there is probably some interplay between three and four, which is three is potential capacity fees for future infrastructure, which would be could be IPR, DPR, could be uh, red gap, and then you've got number four, which is future capacity fees for wastewater. And within that, again, you got another bite at the apple for IPR, DPR, right? So I, there's going to be, I would assume there's going to be some interplay between those two categories as we proceed with the wastewater plant to once Shannon and the team figure out what is going to come out of the back end of the new wastewater plant, which is, is it going to be IPR, DPR, plus reclaim, plus normal, or which is reclaims normal. Um, there's going to be some play there, you know what I mean? So, so directionally, um, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but I, I didn't want you to lose that point that there, that, that I think that discussion is going to live between three and four, unless Shannon, you, you view that differently. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, I don't believe we view that differently. I think we agree. I think we're very intentional on the rate study to not paint us into a box. So we tend to use the firm future water supply and not get into the weeds of what that looks like. Um, because again, we like to have options and available. We know whatever the future water supply is, it's going to cost. Um, and so, and we continue to work all those, all those resources. Okay, great. So I, I think, Mary, to in the notes, I'd say that we have to be conservative. We have two commissioners that are expressing concern about item three. So item four is collect capacity fees towards the cost of a new wastewater treatment facility. Again, amount, timing, TBD, but just the general principle. Does anybody have any concerns about that? And Malcolm, I would think you'd have the same on four that you had on three, yeah? Yeah, I think I do, but I also have a question. New wastewater treatment facility, is that DPR um, or not? I'll let Shannon um, handle that one at this point. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, no, that is not. Expansion of the plant is not um, advanced water purification uh, for potable water. Okay, so that's kind of what I thought. It's not but it's needed, but it's also what the 200 and some million dollar project, right? One of the big ticket items. Um, so I still have the same concern. I think I would, since we do this every few years, I, I don't know if we really need to impact the rate payers now, but, but a good question I have is, well, how much does that affect capacity fees for, or how much would it, I mean, obviously, we're not going to collect all 200 and some million at once. Um, so is it just a, you know, 10 cents towards the dollar in the end? Or how much does this actually affect uh, a new developer and his capacity fees? That's my worry. I guess you don't have to answer that question right this second or anything like that. But 
again, I just worry about the rates because they're going to go up astronomically, I think, in the end, because they have to. So it's just another little thing that's going to add on. That's all. Yep, thank you, Malcolm. I mean, this is why we asked the question, because we want to get everybody's input. So. Yeah, I'm actually in support of three and four, but uh, just to talk to Malcolm a little bit, um, you know, that the, the price tag on Red Gap Ranch is probably more like $400 million. And really, there's no way the city's going to have the bonding capacity even to do it unless they obtain a lot of support from grants, partnerships, whatever. And that's really not on the table right now. It's just the small investment in Red Gap Grant. Well, not small, four million, but so that we're still kicking the can down the road a little bit. Yeah, and I, I understand what you're saying, and I think um, I'm sure not going to hold hold my breath for Red Gap Ranch. Um, I think as people work and and we move forward and we need more capacity. The first thing we're going to do is put more straws in the ground until we've exhausted the Coconino Aquifer, because that's how people are. It's a lot cheaper. So I don't know if Red Gap will ever ha happen in my lifetime, but, you know, we'll see. Um, on three and four, number three, I do like resiliency, but that is going to be one more big jump. So I'm, I don't have a fully formed opinion on that one yet, but. I am a little bit hesitant on that. Number four, if I'm reading this right, it's a very minor difference between collecting fees for the treatment plant or not. I don't. I think that's kind of a no-brainer um, if if I'm reading it right. And so I'd I'd be in support of that. All right, thank you. So I think it sounded like we had potentially two concerned about number three, one person concerned about number four. Um, and then number five was include or do not include loadings capacity along with the flow capacity as a basis for calculating. Does anybody, let's say we include, let's just go with that as the baseline. Does anybody have concerns about including the loadings capacity along with flow? I think it's something we have to do because if we don't meet the demand to handle the loading, which is partially caused by conservation in a lot of ways, um, we're kind of screwed. So, Yeah, I, I agree with you. The more we push for conservation, loading becomes the more critical factor. So it'd be kind of, in my opinion, it'd be a little bit of a blind eye to sort of not look at that. So the water group has been talking to Shannon about alternatives, so. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts on or concerns, I'd say, about including loading from the commissioners? Okay, so we'll say everybody's in agreement on that concept. So, Council Member Tweet, do you feel like you got a, a good pulse from the Commission on that? I do. Thank you for taking the time and, and going through that. No, I appreciate it. Always happy to help. <laughs> okay. Any other? So, Aaron, I, I asked you once already if you had any more capstone comments, and that led to about a half hour. So, <laughs> I'll ask you one more time if uh, any other comments you want to make on top of, of all this to kind of um, summarize or seal it up. That was the one I wanted to use. So thank you. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you to the team for the robust discussion and examples of this. It's um, definitely critical for the city as we move forward. Okay. So that'll take us to item five, which is old business, which we have none. Um, and then item six, informational items, two from the chair, commissioner, staff. I would <laughs> like to make note of some activity by the city council this week in the sense that we have new and potentially departing commission members so and reaffirm. So um, as of yesterday, the city council approved that John Nauman will be uh, extended for a three-year term to December 1st of 26. 
Robert Dilday extended for a term, three-year term in, to December 1st, 2026. Myself as well to December 1st, 2026, which I'm sure people want to get that have a different outcome, but you're stuck with me. And then uh, we will have a new commissioner join the board. Robert Vane will be appointed to a two-year term ending December 1st, 2025. And Commissioner Ruddle um, will be, this is potentially your last meeting. And then, which I personally want to thank you for getting to know you personally, but also all the great work you've done on the commission. And uh, commission, incoming Commissioner Vane, his first meeting will be in February. And Shannon, I think you had a couple comments you want to make on that topic as well. Um, actually, Mr. Chair, I think you covered it. Um, of course, staff is available for questions, but I think you did an excellent job of framing that. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an honor to serve and participate in the work of the city. And I think we all look at it that way. And um, we're very lucky to work with probably the best, the best um, department in the city infrastructure. So thank you, Shannon, the team for keeping us engaged. All right. Um, anybody else have anything for item six, informational items? Mr. Chair, if I if I may, um, maybe Steph get in on a good note. Um, I did just want to mention um, after about six months of search, uh, we at Water Services have selected a new section director of engineering. Uh, Mac McNamara um, will be starting with the Water Services on Monday um, and getting up to speed and filling that role. So I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, we have worked closely with with Mr. McNamara. He was an engineer under the capital planning uh, project manager for a lot of our our projects and so excited to see him join the team and I'm sure you guys will be seeing a lot of him over the next few years but um yeah so just announcing he will be beginning on Monday uh, thank you that's great critical role fantastic okay any other input from commissioners uh, department Mr. Chair. yes sir um this is informational only um I read an article uh, not too long ago uh, about a uh, study of nano nanoparticles in bottled water. Uh, it was presented at AGU back in December, and it was interesting from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, the study was looking at uh, 16 uh, different types or brands of bottled water. None of them, none of them were named uh, to protect the innocent, I suppose you could say if they were compared against tap water from uh, three different uh, uh, public supply systems. And what was interesting about the study was they found that uh, the nanoparticles in bottled water was typically 100 times larger uh, than what you find in tap water. And I, my, Eyes kind of bugged out, like uh, like yours just did, Kurt. Um, one of the uh, one of the other things that they were able to uh, uh, pull out of that study was the fact that uh, the source of that those nanoparticles in bottled water was the uh, filtration process, and the reason that they were able to do that was because the plastics used in filters is a different type of plastic uh, than that used in the uh, in the uh, plastic to, uh, to manufacture and make the bottles. So, and also the, there was a uh, pretty big difference in the type of uh, water treatment between uh, municipal systems and, uh, you know, the uh, water treatment that uh, bottled water goes through. So I thought that was uh, particularly interesting. Uh, nanoparticles of plastic are small enough to get into uh, the human bloodstream. So it's just, it struck me as really, uh, as really a significant uh, uh, study in relationship to the overall impact of uh, plastics. 
that we've been hearing about for the last several years. Uh, one other quick uh, FYI, uh, the price for uranium just peaked over uh, $90 an ounce within the last a uh, couple of weeks, $90, or excuse me, $90 a pound for uranium ore. Uh, what that means is uh, the uh, a lot of the uh, uh, mining companies are starting to go back in and reopen their standby uh, mines to start producing uh, uranium again because it's economically uh, feasible for them to do so. Uh, the um, the uh, Pinion Plain mine just south of Grand Canyon. Uh, I know that they've uh, uh, developed the adits to access the ore bodies. I don't know if they're actually mining yet. And there is uh, a possibility, a pretty good possibility that they're gonna reopen a standby uh, mine on the uh, North Rim as well. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, to know for a couple of points. Uh, they have two haul routes from the Pinion Plain mine. One is due east from the mine uh, to US 89A, and the other one is uh, south through Flagstaff and then back up 89A uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the mill of White Mesa. So. Where's White Mesa? White Mesa is in Utah. It's up around uh, Blanding, I think. Um, pretty sure it's in that general area. So they might take it like through Babbitt Ranch area or north of there. Well, if they if they took the uh, uh, took the dirt road uh, due east across the uh, Kaibab Plateau, parts of it would be crossing the Babbitt Ranch. Yes. Yeah, this stuff about microplastics has hit the national news too. I watched two or three news stories on it, and you know the uh, whatever they put into the plastics leaches out in the cell, um, and there's intricate disruptors, whatever they use as a plasticizers or other chemicals in there to create the structure they want in the plastic. It's it's a huge problem. Big problem. Uh, the main takeaway take uh, that I uh, got from the uh, paper that I read was drink tap water, not bottled water. <laughs> yeah, especially I, bottled waters that have been sitting around for a long time. Yeah, I immediately put my bottled water down when you said that. So yeah, no more. But is it your on the uranium? It's mainly going to be tailings if it happens to be near a river or water supply and or dust right is the the big concern well the the big concern for hauling the uranium is dust but the uh, loads are covered uh to limit the dust as much as possible this all went through environmental review review uh a decade or more ago uh but yeah that's the main concern there's also some concern at the uh at the mine site about uh, the potential for water being produced out of the uh, out of the mine shaft into uh, the evaporation pond somehow getting back into the environment. But you know that also passed uh, state and federal review as well. But you know even after having done that, there are still obviously some concerns on the part of the uh, environmental community. Yeah, we were just at Moab about five months ago and they're still finishing up the project to move all the old tailings away from the Colorado River because they're right on the edge of the river there. It's crazy. So, yeah. Yeah, I've okay. seen that site myself and there's, it was, um, when I saw it back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, it was pretty, impressive that they would allow that kind of material to be put right next to a major river like that. Impressive is one word, yes. <laughs> so, all right, well, with that, we will uh, move to adjourn at 541 and thank you everybody for your participation. And once again, Aaron and the team, thank you so much for your continued work on this. This is, this is a lot, so we appreciate it.
Thank you. Have a good night, everybody.